I'm Shelley Ann Salisbury. Through my interfaith work with Nisa Nashim, the Jewish Muslim Women's Network, I've spoken to a number of spiritual leaders just to see how the effect of COVID-19 has impacted the dealing with their everyday work and their congregation. And also looking at the ways the pandemic has affected religion. Has it made our faith stronger or have some turned away? I thought it would be interesting to have a panel discussion. I've gathered together four spiritual leaders to talk about these subjects openly and frankly, and to discuss the way the pandemic has affected them. I hope you'll find it interesting. It certainly was a very lively discussion. We currently find ourselves in very strange times. The impact of COVID-19 has been far reaching and totally indiscriminate. We may be in different boats, but we're all negotiating the same choppy waters. The foundations of our seemingly storm-proof societal constructs have been badly shaken. In times of trouble, some turn to God, others turn away. What has been the effect of COVID-19 on our religious institutions? How have the spiritual leaders been able to provide comfort and hope within the confines of lockdown? To discuss these and other questions, I'm delighted to be able to introduce our esteemed interfaith panel of spiritual leaders whom I suspect share a great deal in common, more than we perhaps think, and which in the current crisis has certainly been highlighted. So let me, without further ado, go to the panel and start with Rabinette Friedman, who was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York, received a Bachelor of Science in Mathematics from City University of New York, and previously worked as a financial analyst. She then went on to gain an MBA from the University of Alberta, Prior to coming to Hampstead Garden Suburb Synagogue in Northwest London, she was Rebbitson of Beth Israel Synagogue, Edmonton, Canada, and the coordinator of Edmonton's Interfaith Housing Initiative. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Pleasure. Rabbi Gristentag, he was born in Newcastle and brought up in the Gateshead Orthodox Institutions. He received a BA from the Or Samer Tannenbaum College and an MA in Education at the London School of Jewish Studies. He served communities in Hale, South Manchester and St Anne's on Sea, and whilst there taking up the role of Manchester Jewish Student Chaplaincy, and he also sat as a Vice Chair of the Lancashire Forum of Faiths. He is currently the Community Rabbi at Hampstead Garden Suburb Synagogue. Hi. <laughs> Hafiz Sadiq Patel was born and still lives in Blackburn, He's treasurer of the Blackburn with Darwin Interfaith Forum in a voluntary role and is the UK country director of the Al Imdad Foundation, which provides humanitarian services worldwide to the most needy orphans, widows and destitute, irrespective of race, religion, culture and geographical boundary. The foundation also responds to disasters and emergencies. Hello there. Hello, Asalaamu As Alaikum. Nice to see you. And last but not least, Father Alan Walker is the vicar of St. Jude's in Hampstead Garden suburb, where he's been ministering for 25 years. He's originally from the Northeast. Welcome, Alan Walker. Oh, nice to see you. So the, the start of lockdown coincided with three of the most important religious festivals, Easter, Passover, and Ramadan and Eid. How was that? Let's start, I think, with Father Alan. Well, I'm trying to remember just when it, when it did start. We, the last, the last uh, Sunday of public worship was for us the Sunday before Palm Sunday. Easter for us is uh, a week beginning on Palm Sunday and ending a week later on Easter Day. And we have all of our major uh, liturgical events of the year. I mean, the ones that are, you know, need a, a lot of, special preparation for during that week. So we didn't do any of them this year in the normal way. Um, I did them in a variety of ways uh, on, online that I could, uh, that I, you know, you know it, was a, it was a very new experience. And the first service I had to do was uh, the Palm Sunday service, which is usually a very elaborate service with an outdoor procession and all sorts of things. Um, I, I processed on my own. Then our, our the, the other services that week, again, are, are very, very elaborate, but had to be, had to be reduced 
um, either to uh, one of them, the Good Friday service, which has a lot of readings and again, a lot of different um, uh, kind of performances, you might say. It, in fact, it begins with me prostrating on the floor. People always look forward to that because as you said, I've been here so long, it gets harder and harder <laughs> for me to get up from the floor once again, once I've done it. Um, so we, it, was a, it was a fast learning curve in terms of recording things on the, on the iPhone and, and putting them out so those services would be acknowledged. So you actually did use your phone to... For the, well, the for the, for the, yeah, for the, for yeah. the first services. Uh, I mean, we've been doing online services throughout the whole, uh, the whole of lockdown, and uh, I like to think they've got better and more professional and everything as we've been going on. But those very early ones, uh, which were the Holy Week ones, the most important ones of them all, actually, uh, were simply done with me trying to find something in the building I could prop my iPhone up on and uh, point it in the right direction and uh, hope it would hope it, hope hope it would work. Since then, we've got into the world of tripods and yes. proper cameras and editing and all of that sort of thing. So the more sophisticated now, but bit trial and error in the beginning. But it's uh, that was something that took you all by surprise, and it must have been quite a week for you, I can imagine. Mm -hmm. And um, Hafiz Sadiq, can I ask you how how was your Ramadan? Um, our Ramadan was different. Uh, it was hard. Um, I guess for the younger generation, it's something which they're very easy to adapt and accept. But it was probably the most difficult uh, element for the older generation to accept um, in their era. Um, this is something which they hadn't heard of. This is something which they've never anticipated in their living life. Um, and for them to be told not to attend a mosque, um, on the best of days, pre post Ramadan, it's fine. But actually, during the month of Ramadan was probably the most killing factor than the actual COVID itself. And try to convince the older generation to say, this is what the law is, and this is what we've been told to do. It was a mammoth, mammoth task um, uh, with the older generation. They're not IT, they're not tech here at all. Um, uh, so for them to actually try to kind of zoom in and, 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 and those kind of elements of it was just tra transmitting an, an, a receiver where whatever's happening within the mosque um, is being transmitted at homes. That is for general um, uh, people who are at home who can't come to the mosque, who are ill, uh, for the women folk, for the older generation, for them to actually tune into. But now mm -hmm. solely depending on the transmitting service, was just uh, beyond comprehensible for any of our older generation. Yeah. After, the, after the breaking of the fast, an hour and a half later, we have a communal prayer in the evening. Now, during the day, whilst we're fasting, people are at work uh, and obviously hungry. Uh, the last thing you want to do is converse with anybody. But then in the evenings, after your stomach is full and now you feel a bit energetic, then you actually go to the mosque, which is an hour and a half long uh, prayer times within the mosque. And then everybody gets together and, and, and um, uh, you know, uh, have a, a kind of a catch up with everything. Just none of that was non-existence. And for the younger ones, it, it took them by surprise, but adapted well. But with the older generation, it just didn't sit. Okay, yeah. So Passover, or also known as Pesach. Um, Rabbanit Friedman, would you like to comment on this one? Sure, thank you. Um, yeah, so it's, it's interesting, very similar um, issues that we also had to deal with. I mean, you talk about the elderly, uh, you know, Passover is a time for when the family comes together, right? When everybody sits at our Seder table and it was really difficult for the elderly because they had to not only be uh, separated from family, but had to be alone. And those who didn't have any partner with them um, was even more difficult, and they really could not understand it. How, how could I spend Pesach, Passover, on my own? I haven't done this. I've had 80 seders, and this is the one I, on my own. It was just really, really painful and difficult, very difficult time. Um, we, we, you know, we arranged, we had planned a communal seder, you know, where we get together and feast together. Um, and that was out of the question. Um, so it was, it, it took a real uh, big question mark for all of us of how are we going to get through it? Um, the, the, the amazing thing is that the community came together because during this time where we need to have 
Um, we eat a lot. We eat over the, over eight days special foods. We you know we take out all the leaven and um, and and have the the special foods, the matzah, the the, the flat breads, and and specific symbolic foods. And while it was difficult because it was really the the lockdown happened right before all the you know before the holiday, and so we needed to go shopping and get all the you know practical things to to do. Um, where we were shut down and. Um, what, what was beautiful was that the community came together um, and those who were able to go out, um, did the shopping, were able to be there for those who, who couldn't, who, who were in lockdown or isolated. So uh, there was a lot of love and care um, during this time. And uh, although um, very, very uh, sad time for, for those who are isolated. Right, yeah, exactly. So I think we could say that all, all these, all the religions, um, dealt with the same the same issue in very much the same way. Um, and talking about the online aspect, um, platforms such as Zoom, which is everybody will now have heard of, of course, have been utilized and proved very useful. But I imagine, uh, Rabbi Guttentag, perhaps you'd like to comment here that for the uh, Jewish religion, this has proved quite difficult in the Orthodox um, uh, as a sector because the, the use of technology on the Sabbath and a high holy days is not permitted. Yeah, so there are, there are members here who have that desire to do some kind of service on a Shabbat morning on a Saturday to be involved in a service. Yet at the same time, we're not allowed to do it within the within halacha, within the laws of our religion but what we do is we work around it so before the onset of shabbat before sunset uh, our cantor has an abrami will do a service which is very very well attended and people join in there and they comment on the um, on the facebook messages so you can see it brings the people together he does a very nice service um, he has his son does a piano in the background and that we're not allowed to do in the synagogue so that's like an added benefit and it's a lovely service and the people i speak to say oh i can't manage without that we're also doing following the termination of Shabbat immediately after nightfall on a Saturday night. We do the have the last ceremony. So we get different members from the community. This is something that's usually done at home. So a family who were doing it anyway would take, have a rotor to um, do it to um, do, go online and let other people watch in. And that also has very good attendance. So we've got a lot before and a lot after. But during Shabbat itself, there is absolutely nothing at all online. But that actually brings home the message of what our religion really or really is all about. Shabbat is a time when we switch off. And I think nowadays we need that more than ever because we're such a fast paced society in an instant world. We need, you know, what's that instant message? If you don't reply to a message in 10 minutes, you're rude and people want to, but for 25 hours a week, we switch off and we spend time with our family, with ourselves, and of course, with our creator as well. And religion is not just about the synagogue about the home. And I think this has actually made so many people realize how true that is. So on Saturday, so you haven't got the pressure of, you know, dressing yourself up and being in, in, at the synagogue on time and praying with the community, which normally we do do and we like, but we're making the most of, now that we've got the other opportunity to actually spend more time with our family and even do the religious stuff with our family. So on the Shabbat morning with our family, we sing all the songs that we're so familiar with from, from the synagogue with our kids and you know my little seven-year-old gets to choose what tune we're doing next uh, so we're actually really making the most of it so we're bringing the religion more into our home which really what it's all what is it's all about well, that's all well and good for families who, who have children and support and uh have you know people at home but i'm just thinking about those who are usually the elderly and living on their own it must be a very difficult time without this uh, direct contact because a lot of people who I've spoken to have said to me that one of the big things they missed was actually going and speaking to and uh, the social aspect which I'll come on to later of going into their um, place of worship That's definitely a valid point and it is yeah. Hard. yeah yeah, yeah. So um, it's been said by a lot of people, actually, that there's been a kind of religious renaissance. And I want to ask you, and I'll ask you all separately, but, you know, do you feel people are actually praying more during lockdown? Is their faith growing stronger? Um, it's, a, it's a strange thing to say, but do you think the pandemic has done religion a bit of a favour? 
Can I start with maybe um, um, Hafiz Sadiq? Can I ask you that? What do you think? Yes, of course you can. There's a few elements. And one of the elements I feel that spiritually the families became very more spiritual was the fear factor. You know, in terms of what we're currently going through, uh, nobody knows what's going to happen. Obviously, nobody knows in terms of where it's going to lead to. And at that time, at the most severe time we were going through when the death rates were going higher and higher, the fear factor within the Muslim, especially within the Muslim community who I've interacted and conversed with was, this could be day of judgment. It could be coming to judgment time. And that is why religiously, everybody became very spiritually and everybody became very connected. And I think it was a, a big, big fear that was going through everybody's mind and soul at that time. Right, so, th so th there was this idea that this was some sort of judgment and I'm not going to use this word lightly, but a punishment possibly yeah. for, for, for whatever reason. And, and we'll talk about that later. We'll talk about it later on, yeah. Rabbanet Friedman, would you like to comment on what, what your views are on this? Yeah, yeah um, thank you. So it's, it's actually quite interesting. Um, the, where, you know, we have, um, you know, like Rabbi Guttentag said, our religion, is, our tradition is not b basically focused on the synagogue, right? We, we know that the, our sages tell us the world stands on three things. Um, we have the Torah, Avodah, and Gemilut Chasadim. We have Torah is, is our, our book of the Bible. We have Avodah, which refers to prayer and um, service. And um, then we have the Gemilut Chasadim, which is acts of kindness. So these three items can be done outside the synagogue. And we were forced to do them outside. Well, while we had the synagogue, we, we took it, we had um, Bible classes in the, in the synagogue. We have prayer, obviously, and services in the synagogue. And then we also have acts of good kindness that comes out of that. But since we were forced to be out of the building, we had to figure out ways to, to be able to still stand on these three pillars. And we managed that through online classes. So our online um, Bible classes um, were able to, 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 uh, to, do, to be on online and there was so many opportunities for that um we, we uh, as well as so we had um uh, services that went virtually every day very good talk talked about before shabbat and after shabbat but um we we pray three times a day we have morning and afternoon and evening services so we had virtual what we call virtual minyanim virtual prayer service where people logged on to a zoom and prayed together even though they were singularly standing in their own room praying but they were doing it via Zoom, um, which was a great comfort to many, uh, just being able to be virtually with somebody praying. Um, and then we had these, like I mentioned earlier, these acts of kindness that continued throughout, even after Passover, uh, where we continued doing shopping for the elderly um, and, and cooking for the NHS and so on and so forth. I had one Karian tell me, um, you know, she wasn't an, a regular shul goer, uh, you know, she didn't attend services on a regular basis, but she felt more connected to the synagogue now than she ever been because she was providing these meals for, for the elderly and isolated. Do, do you think the Renaissance relates more to a community coming together, irrespective of religion, just happens to be within a Jewish community? Right. So, I mean, um, I, I, I believe that religion is in our traditional Judaism. Judea, Judaism. Um, we community plays a, a huge part, so it's not a separate entity. So being a, while it's a community renaissance, it's also a Jewish renaissance at the same time. Uh, you know, it, it allows the community the, to, to flow in. You know, the the tradition allows community renaissance to flow um, out of that. Right. Right. Okay. Thank you. And uh, Father Allen, how how do you see your um, congregation, or or perhaps? Uh, the wider congregation that don't normally attend services, um, have you found there's been more uh, involvement from those that you hadn't normally expected to be involved because of this? I think, I mean, I think you're onto something. <laughs> I think the real answer is it's probably a bit too early to say. At the same time, there, there's certainly been, I mean, I, it's interesting, uh, I was pleased earlier on you said it wasn't just... Uh, the elderly who have trouble with the, the internet and that sort of thing. I mean, it's people who have trouble with the internet, who have trouble with the internet. And you know, it's been a comfort to many people who can't normally get to church, whatever age they are, that we've been putting things 
online and we put a few extra things online. I mean, we, we, we have an early morning and a, and a late night a sort of going to bed service, which we don't normally have in church. Just, it was one of the first things, I, I don't know why it struck me, it was just one of the first things I thought I would simply record. I mean, it's something I know interesting. It's not as long as the Quran, Sadiq, but I do know it off by heart. Um, and so I was able to recite this, you know, uh, in, in, in the church late at night in the dark, um, which, you know, meant something to me uh, personally. And I, I, I put that online. So, you know, there's no, there's no visuals really, apart from just a picture of the church. And then you hear me reciting the, 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 the kind of going to bed at the end of the day service lasts about 10 minutes or, or, or something. And that surprisingly proved one of the most popular things I did. Um, I suppose it's often at night time when you're going to bed that people reflect, that we have a tradition of people reflecting on the day, how the day's gone, what could have been different, and so on and so on and so forth. What do you do? Well, I mean, so, uh, you know, to, 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 to have that, not, not to be saying it together, but just hearing it coming from the church that you're familiar with um, is, uh, I think, has proven quite a surprising comfort to, uh, to, other, to, 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 to many people. And of course, using the, I think others have touched on this as well. I mean, using the, but in the we, we've used YouTube. We've put things on YouTube. So on the whole, they've, you know, they've gone out to, the, gone out to anyone who wants to, anyone who comes across them, anyone who want, watches them. And, uh, yeah. you know, and, and, and again, it's very hard really to interpret the, the statistics. I mean, sometimes you seem to get an absurd yeah. number of people. You can't, you think something's gone wrong with the counter. You know, more people than you'd ever see in church, even even you know, on our, at our biggest service or something. You know, which is midnight mass on a, on Christmas on Christmas Eve. Um, I I, su I suppose that's partially re could be reflected in personal circumstances where they may have had um, an, a sick ma family member due to COVID or, or or otherwise, but mostly during this time, and the prayer was suddenly something that they felt they could do. Well, I think it might it being a bit early to say really because I think mm. that. We, you know, we, we really answer the question of a specifically kind of spiritual renaissance, which is what you're asking about. I am. I think I am. A, little, a, little, a, little bit a little bit further down, further down yes. the line. I mean, yes. I, I feel that the engagement, I sense that the engagement um, of, of, of people with the kind of things we've been doing, with things like our, our Twitter feed, I mean, I, which has always been there, you know, it's not new because of the, 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 the pandemic, it's always been there, but that's seen a little bit of, you know, a, a little bit more debate, a little bit more dialogue, a little bit more uh, reflection. It's been quite a, uh, I mean, it's been quite a pleasant surprise. People, um, I mean, it's hard, hard to say without, you know, going into individual cases, or, as we say, but I mean, it, 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 it's been quite uh, revealing to me who tends, well, I shouldn't say this, but, you know, perhaps you're often dealing with kind of bureaucratic issues and this sort of thing. You yeah. know, have people, either bureaucratic issues or people with genuine issues and problems, you know. But, but in between that, people just saying, oh, I found comfort in that, you know, I found mm -hmm. something in that. And so has so-and-so, you know, who's not someone I necessarily know or, or only know in a very, you know, not directly connected with the community. Because that's the sort of thing you wouldn't normally hear about, I don't think. You know, you yes. tend to hear about big yeah. things about them. Yes, I, I, think, I, I think from what I can see, uh, you've all been able to bring something different, but uh, something that resonates with your communities and your parishioners and your flock and, and, and your congregants, uh, different words used for different uh, religions. Um, but the people that would normally feel the need for that, you have tried, and I can see extremely hard to connect uh, but the one thing that is very difficult, I, I, I heard uh, from some people who I spoke to, um, is the way that lockdown has affected the collective worship. So I know that from uh, a visit to a mosque I had a couple of years ago, I was very um, uh, uh, comforted and also surprised to, to see how close everybody gets when they're praying. It's a shoulder to shoulder prayer. Um, yes. Hafiz Sadiq, you will obviously be nodding there. And I didn't realize that happened. And it was a sudden sort of shock. And then I thought, oh, wow, this is, uh, this is, this is amazing. So it was, the, it was the physical proximity that amplified the prayer. But the collective prayer is so, uh, it's, it, it's, it, it's such a, it has such a strong feeling and creates a wonderful atmosphere. Worshipping in church in, in our tradition is, is extremely important because our tradition is what we call a Eucharistic tradition. Um, I mean, you can do everything uh, 
on your own at home. But what you can't do is, is celebrate the Eucharist, share the, the, the bread and wine of the Eucharist. That depends on the presence of a priest, that's me, and, the, and, uh, and coming together for, for liturgical worship. So that's been a, that's what people, that's what people have missed. Um, now, of course, many people miss that anyway, because they're housebound uh, for whatever reason, for age or illness. And I normally take communion to people in their homes. And, for the, and that's been very one of the hardest things not to be able to do. I mean, clearly collective worship, you know, is absolutely essential, absolutely important for the majority of people. But one of the most difficult things has been, has been my, you know, the, the inability, the prohibition on entering people's home to include them in the liturgical worship, in the communal worship, through, through what we call sick communion, taking the, the bread of the sacrament to, the, to, to, to people at home. I mean, that's, that's, you know, that, that really, to go back to the spiritual question earlier, I mean, that's the one that, that, that really is uh, grinding. I mean, yes, of course, when we get together, we, we have readings, we have discussions, we have, we have music, we have, we have singing, we, we, we miss all of those. But there is this very deep spiritual encounter, which we believe is taking place with, with God in Christ, from a Christian mm -hmm. point of view, at that at, at that moment and that's well, not, it's not been not been possible no and i think that's something that all the religions and uh, particularly you know today we're, we're looking at the you know the three um, the, the muslim jewish um, and uh, christian religion um share is the physical acts of worship the communal singing the praying the giving communion baptisms weddings but mitzvahs bar mitzvahs pilgrimages i mean for example the hajj hafiz sadiq i mean that's been incredibly uh upsetting from uh, countless uh, people um how, how has that been sort of when you have been giving your spiritual guidance to uh, your community how have you supported the feeling of loss that must have come from not being able to do these things well uh, that's right um uh, hajj is one of the things um uh, pilgrimage that one takes upon um once in a lifetime providing they have the finance and the means and the opportunity um but even prior to that, um, uh, there's an optional um, pilgrim that people take upon to go Saudi Arabia during the fasting month of Ramadan. Now, that element, the fact that they couldn't go, a lot of people, especially the older generation, being in the holy month, spending in the holy city, you know, retired uh, and they've got the financial means to do it. They go and spend 10 days, 20 days, or even full 30 days, the whole month of Ramadan in Saudi Arabia. That being stopped for them was the first biggest um, uh, task we had to kind of deal with. But we were right in the midst of the severity of the COVID crisis, hence people understood. But then the fear element came that this could, it's not going anywhere very near future. And it could be the fact that Hajj could be cancelled. Mm. And even up till now, um, uh, the announcement, would it, you know, will it be cancelled, will it not be? And just yesterday, it was announced that all the um, pilgrims for international countries will not be allowed for this year. Only the local um, people will be allowed to perform Hajj this year. Again, it's, it, it's, it's, it's a sad element, the fact that, number one, you've been reframed. You've got to look at the older mentality here. We've been told not to go to the mosque. And now we've been told not to go to the, the house of God. You know, what is happening? And that mentally, it, it took a lot of uh, kind of um, discussions and a lot of talks, spiritual talks given by our local imams to these elderly people and even the younger generation to explain in terms of, you know, yes, this is, you know, uh, it's not happening for whatever reason uh, we are, that's come upon us, but it's not something which is on a permanent basis. You know, if God willing, you will be back in the house of God, not just within the local mosque, but within the the places of pilgrim as well. So, um, uh, so, ha so Hafiz said that you've been you, your role. So that in this situation has been keeping the positivity and right. and the future will get better mm -hmm. and looking forward, and which is which is right. incredibly powerful. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And can I ask maybe Rabbi Gutentag to talk about uh, the um, in the Jewish religion, obviously, for. Uh, 
uh, prayers, physical acts of prayers, and um, especially looking at funerals. I know you've just come back from performing some services at a, at a funeral uh, today. Um, you, uh, it, there, there is a requirement for 10 men to be present uh, to allow a funeral, for example, to go ahead. Um, most of our prayers can be recited at home and the online services we provide, the, the order of service and the content will be mostly the same. With the exception of Kaddish, the well-known prayer which mourners will say uh, following the loss of a loved one or on the anniversary of that date of death on the yard site. Now that can only be said with the physical presence of a minyan of the quorum of ten. Uh, that we can't do now and many people who were saying Kaddish do feel it's hard for them, right? Uh, and it, 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 that is hard. And although they understand that the the point of saying that prayer, we call it the mourner's prayer, but it's actually nothing to do with mourning and nothing to do with uh, death, not the death prayer. But it's, it's a prayer to glorify God's name, but we do that in memory of the deceased, of our loved ones who are no longer with us. So they do understand that we could do other things in their memory. They give charity in their name, take them more acts of kindness, they study some Torah or a Mishnah, some of our teachings in, in their memory. But there is something about that prayer, Kaddish, which many feel, that many people feel it is cathartic, it's therapeutic. And it's those group of people, I think, who, who, are, who are in the year following the loss of a parent who are really looking forward to the return of Shul so that they can continue doing that. And when it comes to funerals, um, the funeral can still take place, but unless there's, there, there are 10 men there, we can't say the Kaddish. So sadly, we've done a lot of funerals, more than usual, but without that particular prayer said. Once everything is allowed, we're going to do a lot of catching up to do. We'll do special memorial services for them in their home. And please God, when we're allowed to do stone settings with a bigger crowd, so those who didn't have the full funeral, um, they can have more of their wider family instead of just the immediate and all their friends. Um, so that is very hard. Right, so, so when you talk about stone setting, just for those who don't know what that is, that's, that's nine months to a year after the person has been buried, the funeral, there is uh, erected a, a stone, literally a headstone, um, and the person's life is then commem commemorated at that point. Yeah, and we consecrate that stone on the grave site, and that's, that's a right. religious ceremony that goes with that. And again, that prayer of Kaddish will be recited by the family at that service. <laughs> Many people have said to me that one of the biggest, uh, uh, well, the, 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 the biggest problems they've had to deal with is, it, you know, when, when their loved ones have actually died due to COVID, whatever, um, not being able to actually go physically has been incredibly, diff very, very difficult. Just the cathartic element of saying goodbye. How would you say you have comforted those who just feel that they're not really um, haven't haven't properly said goodbye to their loved ones. Um, Rabbanit Friedman, would you like to say how you provide that comfort? It's been a very difficult time. I think you know many people um, ha have uh, have suffered during our, our, and are still, and we haven't even seen um, uh, the bulk of it. You know whether uh, emotionally, even financially, uh, but those who have lost loved ones during this time, I think really. Uh, suffered tremendously because they didn't even have the opportunity even in hospital to say goodbye, right? There was that lockdown period where they weren't even allowed to enter um, and and let alone some weren't even allowed to be at a funeral, um, whether they were distant, you know, physically distant, you know, they couldn't travel. And so it, it's been really, really, uh, really difficult. And so, uh, you know, we do as much, you know, as Slowly lockdown eased up. I mean, we started on the phone, you know, speaking to the individuals, um, offering our comfort, offering, um, you know, anything, you know, meals we, we provided um, and, and, and prayers. Um, the, the Book of Psalms have been very comforting during this time as well. There is, a, a, especially those who were, who were sick during this time, there were several groups um, were set up to, to offer those prayers in group so everybody was able to feel that community once again okay i think also um the feedback i got from the, the um pool of 
resource that I was speaking to, and it's quite diverse, uh, a number of people I was asking about how they felt about the effect of COVID on religion and institutions and, and their faith, uh, was that, that suddenly the spiritual leaders was, were, became really important to them. Whereas before you were seen as, well, you know, you're sort of, you, you exist in a big building, um, they don't really have much to do with you unless you're on the inner sanctum or inner circle. And that's very often seen as quite a hard thing to break through. And uh, if, you're not, if you're not deemed to be particularly religious or seem to be particularly involved, and suddenly they wanted to reach out. And I'm sure you've all felt that, uh, that whole shift in the way that you're, you're actually being expected to provide comfort in a very different way. Would you agree with that, Father Alan? Do you think that's worked in that way for you? You know, one of the ways the Church of England works is that we have this idea of the geographical parish. Uh, majority of people who live in my parish from Hampstead Garden suburb belong to another religion. So my own community is, is relatively small. But what's interesting is that I will be asked, and I have been asked during the lockdown, to ask to take the funerals of people who I've never met before. And that becomes very, that's very challenging but also very interesting and rewarding because you discover smaller sort of groups of people within, a, within, a, within, your, within your area, within your remit, who, who I, as the, the parish priest, have a responsibility for, for looking after, but have only come across because of the, because of the need to take a funeral. I mean, for example, um, I took a funeral for someone who lived in Hampstead Garden suburb, but came from the Filipino community. Um, but it's a whole other, other sort of part of the whole dynamic of, of, of what's been going on. So, the, you know, the pastoral care there has been meeting people, meeting the bereaved for the first time, taking the funeral, often some distance away because, you know, the, the way it's been organised, certainly in my experience, the funerals have often taken place at crematoriums or, or um, burial grounds, um, some way remote from from, from, from where, you know, where, where, where I live. So I've been getting to visit some of these places I haven't been to before. So you, you've actually been widening your circuit, so to speak. You've actually gone out a month. Well, not, in the sense, not in the sense of recruitment or because, <laughs> you know, <laughs> because it's usually the person who's died who lives in the parish. Mm -hmm. The people who are, the people who, the, the bereaved are often people living some distance away. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you were talking about, again, going back to my earlier discussion about um, recording services on, you know, on cameras and smartphones, videos, and that sort of thing. So, I mean, I, you know, the limit, the limited number of people at the funeral, the funeral is limited to just ten people at that, at that point, all socially distancing. But of course, it's being recorded and actually then being shown to several hundred people in another country. Yeah. You know. Yes. So. <laughs> well, when I say a wider circuit, what I mean is that suddenly you are. Uh, rather than sort of physically sort of being within sort of, you know, central square, north square, south square, and sort of little, your image is, is getting out there. And I think that you are, you are, you are then, your, your message is getting out there too, which it must also be for uh, Rabbi Nitbatia, for Rabbi, Rabbi Gutentag, and, and Hafiz Sadiq, what about you? How have you been um, going outside your normal remit and, and you know, sort of a bit like... Um, you know, Father Alan, are you also doing uh, things over and above your normal everyday okay. unit? In terms of spiritual leaders, I'm uh, at home. I would say, you know, we're talking about the negatives in terms of the, you know, from, out from, from my end, but there were a lot of positives at the same time. The spirituality within the family, uh, the fact that it's probably the most time I have spent during the month of Ramadan at home than at mosque. You know, all my prayers used to be in the mosque outside um, COVID. Now all the prayers were at home. And then I had to then lead the prayers at home with three women at home, wife and two daughters, just to clarify. Um, uh, <laughs> the wife and two daughters, I'm um, uh, 17 and 9, 8, uh, 21 year old. For them to lead the prayers, you know, for them to follow prayers behind me was unique for them because it's something which they've never seen or never, you know, never done at home. So in terms of spirituality within families, was a lot more appreciated. And then spiritual leaders, a lot of like myself, Hafiz at home or Imams at home, but they're not Imams or Hafiz at home. They're outside within their community. But now they were utilized at home within their own family household. Yeah. So yeah. the younger generation, yeah. 
really good spiritually uplifting them um, uh, so that was again a, a very very good element and now i've completely forgot the question don't yeah. worry but i'm picking up yeah. on the word spirituality because mm. or spiritual because i have to ask now you know how is coronavirus seen spiritually does it have a spiritual context how do you how do people of faith cope philosophically with this phenomenon is it a plague is it a warning is it a punishment bigger plan and i think also it begs the question is there a god why would a god why would a, a good kind god allow this to happen and you must have been asked this question so i'm going to ask all of you you know none of you are going to get to get, to get out of this question um has god forsaken us uh rabbi guttentard i'm just going to start with you <laughs> Yeah, so uh, for no particular reason. Yeah. Um, we have been asked this a lot, and we're, we're not prophets. No rabbi, I don't think any spiritual leader could come along and say, you know, this is why it's happened. It's because you're doing such and such. God is now punishing us. We don't have the knowledge, the prophecy to, in this day and age, to be able to say that. What I do think is that, that everyone can take their personal message from it. Um, and many people have. Not everyone, obviously, but uh, many people have, they realize, you know, there was something going on in my life, which I know shouldn't have. Now that everything's changed, you know, we're going back to basics. What's really, you know, there's no holiday, there's no extras, no traveling. Um, you know, even work is, for many have been reduced depending on your line of work. And, you know, we're back to the core of the essence of life. And it has certainly been a, quite a strong spiritual wake up call for many people. Um, to say why it happened, we can't say that. But I think many people have found they can take a personal message from it. We don't know why God has allowed it to happen, but they, they can take something personal from it. And what, uh, what one person will take from it will be inappropriate for another person. So I wouldn't give it like a public uh, speech or sermon about it because I think it's a, it's a personal thing. Uh, but what I do find is, and this is from before COVID as well, that people who have strong uh, religious convictions generally, in my experience, can cope with certain things better, even when it comes to a bereavement under normal, well, never normal, but under normal circumstances, when it comes to a bereavement, when they've got faith in, you know, I don't know why this happened, but you know, this is what God has put me through, I'm gonna rise up to it. They'll deal with it, with it better. While some people can lose the faith when it comes to someone like this, while others, surprisingly enough, through this, suddenly they'll see the hand of God. Um, and they'll become even closer. I mean, even something as extreme as a Holocaust survivor, who I, I've asked this question to them many times, but very, many different answers to it. But one survivor said, you know, where was God during those years? He said, where was God? He was with me, you know? And they became even more religious from it. So it, it's very much a personal thing, and everybody will take out what they're sometimes, you know, as spiritual leaders, we can help them with that, only if they ask. I wouldn't do it unsolicited. Uh, so we can help them through it and, you know, talk about their personal lives, etc. It's very much a personal thing. And there will be, you know, ask many people, you get even more answers and everyone will take it differently. Right. So I, I can see um, Hafez Sadiq is nodding away at what you're saying, Rabbi Guttentag. And I even saw Rabbi Nick Friedman also nodding. And I think Alan Walker. Uh, do you all agree with what uh, Rabbi Guttentag has said in essence? Or do you have a differing uh, view on this. I can see Alan, Alan Walker is um, raring to go. Go on. I mean, I think, you know, of course I agree with him, yes, but we, <laughs> we've begun our conversation today very much talking pastorally, which I think is appropriate. That's how things impact us immediately. I mean, theologically, uh, Christians believe we live in a fallen world, a world characterized by sorrow, uh, by suffering. The, the Church of England funeral service uh, is very much a service of thanksgiving about being delivered from the miseries of this world. So, you know, speaking theologically, we're not here to enjoy ourselves. We're here to, to, throw, to, to strive with God in a, in a bigger process, a bigger plan. We don't know what that plan is. We're only small parts of it. But I think what we all agree on is that that plan uh, involves the growth and the expansion of uh, justice and compassion uh, in the world. And uh, the more we can uh, bring that about, the more we're serving uh, that, that greater plan. I think, I think also it's perhaps, uh, you know, you, you talk about whether, whether it, you know, it's, it's interesting that the pandemic is sometimes, disasters are, are, are threaten 
uh, belief in God, well, what would the opposite be? You know, are we more likely to believe in God when we're happy, wealthy, you know, long lived and all of that? The evidence suggests not. I think it's no coincidence. Uh, we Christians believe in providence. I think it's no, it's no coincidence that the pandemic has also seen uh, the Black Lives Matter um, campaign. I think it's, 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 it's brought our attention to injustice in the world and the, and the need for compassion. So I think that would be my, that would be my, my, my theological reflection. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, as Hafiz Sadiq, do you have anything to add to that? No, I agree with, 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 with Alan and, and with Robias. We've had plagues historically in our scriptures and uh, in our narrations. There has been plagues um, uh, you know, upon uh, people where you know, it was a sign of punishment. You know, um, uh, so for people to reflect in terms of what had happened in the past does have um, uh, slightly pressure uh, on the people um, uh, on, in, in this day and age. But I think the, probably the, 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 the adverse to that is the fact that people actually got more closer uh, to God. It was time to actually reflect um, uh, and get closer to your believer and, um, uh, and maybe time to repent, you know, um, uh, and, and it was something which there's always a good thing, even though after adversity there's always ease and we feel the fact that ease will come. It'll get people to us more close towards God and ease will come and it's on the horizon and people will see that and people will believe that. Thank you very much. Rabinette Friesman, what, do you have anything more to you'd like to add? Yeah, I mean, uh, I agree with yeah, everything. Um, it, it, the, the thing is, you know, in our tradition, um, you know, we we can question why, but we we don't we don't know the answers, right? We uh, we, we otherwise, if we knew the answers, we'd be God. And um, and and specifically to our tradition in, in Judaism, this is not the worst tragedy that has occurred. Mm -hmm. You mentioned the Holocaust. You know, the six million. Uh, you know, that's 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 a large number. Um, and I think what to, to, to try to comprehend why and how and where is God in all this is really, is, is really out of our, um, as human, limited um, capabilities. But what we could do, uh, and this is, you know, alongside the same line as, as Rabbi Guntag, is to really take a personal message and, and what we can learn from it, what we can, how can we uh, be better people and and I think that's what Hafiz said and, 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 and Father, um, as well as to, to just, you know, take something positive from it and, and grow as a person and as a, as a community. So again, I'm getting a message from all of you, uh, you know, of looking forward and the positive aspects. And that is how we're going to cope. And that's how we deal with the situation. Um, and, not, and not just give up and say, well, that, that's the end of it. And um, it's, it's a very positive message. Has the pandemic heralded a change in the way that the services are provided? Um, Will we carry on with these online services? Will there be a need for these buildings, these amazing buildings that we have, St. Jude's, that beautiful, beautiful church that dominates um, along, alongside the free church, by the way, uh, Father Allen, I'm not forgetting the free, well, okay. But they know, they're equal sizes, I have checked. Um, they're very beautiful, we have, you know, we have a wonderful mosque. I haven't, I haven't visited your mosque, obviously, Hafiz Sadiq, one day. I may, may well go up to Blackburn and have a look. Um, and obviously, I, I, know, I, know, yeah, I know Hampstead Garden Suburb um, sitting off very well. Again, auspicious, beautiful, um, spiritual buildings. Is there a future for these? Uh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, I think, you know, uh, the people who have you know, who have never, who haven't gone to shul on a synagogue on a regular basis, um, have now, that now have been told they can't want to come back. So, so people are, 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 are yearning to come back um, to the synagogue because it is a place um, where community comes together. And while, and at, but at the same time, we have, you know, where, where we use the technology to be able to connect, I think there will be an opportunity, a recognition that we will be using this going forward. I mean, you, you know, just to mention, you, we talked about, you know, the, how, how we comfort those, um, you know, those who lost loved ones during this time. You know, one of the ways we did that, you know, we have a seven-day mourning period called the Shiva, where visitors would come in every day to visit, you know, uh, the mourner. And while that wasn't able to be done physically, and it's a really therapeutic process um, where, where many have, have, have lost that opportunity, what we did create was a Zoom Shiva. Sh Shiva opportunity and that 
did wonders for people because those who were far away, uh, you know, physically were able to connect and um, even to be at a funeral, uh, you know, who couldn't make it there were able to do Zoom funerals, which are people are now thinking, oh, maybe this is a way um, going forward where whatever, for whatever reason, I can't make it to my grandmother's funeral, perhaps I can zoom in. So, this, you know, things like that. I mean, Rabbi Guntag and I created a, uh, we have a, a Norris Lee TV where we create an opportunity to connect with our, 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 our members, our community. Watch it. Watch it. <laughs> I have a, a little plug, a little plug there. Um, <laughs> and, and I think, you know, something that perhaps we, we, we will take forward, uh, you know, in, into after post, uh, you know, and, and, and it's exciting. I mean, at the same time, right, we need to be able to balance that. But, but to say that there's no place for the city, I, I, there, there's, there's a, I think it'll actually um, open the doors to many now mm -hmm. um, yeah. once they were able to see what was uh, behind it, inside it, yeah. through the virtu yeah. virtually. Um, and would Father Alan and Hafez Sadiq agree with that? Father well, Alan, I'll let you go first. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, I mean, I. Yeah. Again, it remain, remains to be seen, you know, with the, with the broadcast services, we, you know, we're, now that we're about to go back to church, we're getting, the, you know, that's the question that's come up, you know, well, why didn't you do this before having things on? <laughs> are, you going to, are you going to continue doing it? Of course, the danger is that, uh, you know, if you, if you put it on YouTube, they can watch it in the afternoon and not turn up to the actual event in the morning or, 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 or something. I mean, I, you know, I keep saying this, we don't quite know yet, but I, I think we really don't. I mean, uh, it'll be fascinating to see how things, I'm optimistic, you know, uh, I'm hopeful that, uh, that, mm -hmm. that good, good, good will come out of this in, in, yeah. in every way. Yeah, and, and, and you have to say what, what Okay, you say? I've, I've written a paragraph here that online services for MOSS is definitely a no-no, definitely <laughs> not a way forward, especially for the younger generation, as I feel, and this is my own personal feeling, that, that, that it will give them encouragement to detach themselves from attending MOSS, having online services and facilities available sat on their own couch at home. And that is starting to happen now. These solitary mosques have now opened. I now have the option to go to the mosque to do a prayer bath, or, ah, and I'll do it after the 4th of July. Now, when we allow then, and you already start that laziness starts creeping in the fact that, well, you can do it at home. You don't really need to go to the mosque. If that starts kicking in with the younger generation, as the older generation are diminishing, we need the younger generations to fill in the mosque. We won't have them. So, so Hafez Sadiq, are you saying that really it's the connection with the physical uh, building and the community that will, yeah. will, will give that sort of um, spirituality Absolutely. and grow the spirituality? It's Absolutely. not something that can be done sort of Sat quietly at home, at home yeah. as and when you feel like it. No. Right, that's I mean, interesting. Du during during the, um, uh, the mosque I'm affiliated to, we have 3,000 members. And within those 3,000 members, we got together two meter distancing on a Saturday afternoon, three, 400 of us, all young volunteers, and serviced 7,000 homes um, around Blackman with Darwin. Oh. Anybody knocked at every single door and asked them if they need any essentials, if they, if they required any help and service. We also, we got a list of handy workers, plumbers, um, uh, fitters in any way or form, as 24 hour maintenance service. If anybody required any help and service, free of charge, we used to provide that within our community. Now, mm -hmm. this would only happen if you all come together, not through via WhatsApp groups and um, through Instagram, definitely not. Right, oh, okay, okay, that's interesting. Some people would say that the internet provides a lot of that support mm -hmm. and younger generation, that's how they will garner that support. Mm -hmm. We're a different generation, we. Uh, I, I class all of us probably as mm -hmm. a completely different generation well, I definitely am and I, I just want to say fine I just well before I thank you all for this really interesting discussion I just want to ask you just a one thing a high and a low from the last three months we'll start off with Rabbi Guttentag a high and a low mm -hmm. I would say that the high is the amount of people we've had joining our online services a low is Again, I think we've covered this is the people dying alone and people, widows, not being able to attend their husband's funeral. That's been a big glare and it's very difficult to try and comfort somebody like that, except obviously to be there for them. Um, and the death threat, I think what really hit me, when it really hit me was, it was Air of Pesach, it was the eve of Passover, which is one of the busiest days of the year. And 
I had a funeral at 3 p.m., which is a very difficult time to go. We've got family and everything to prepare. Uh, we did that funeral, and on the way home, it's a 23-minute drive. The car basically drives itself between the cemetery and uh, and my house. 23 minutes. During that 23-minute drive, I got two further calls from two different families who have just had bereavement. So I've just done one, then we've got two more, and that's when it really hit me like this is serious. This is no joke. Thank you. And a personal high and a low for you, uh, Father Allen. Well, I mean, similarly, you know, to Rabbi Gutentag, I think the, I, I, was in, um, I was in isolation for two weeks before lockdown began because I'd had contact with someone in a, in a, in a nursing home who proved positive for corona. I wasn't able myself to take the funeral of uh, someone from my own congregation who I knew extremely well um, you know, as a friend as well as a, a member of the congregation who had been housebound for many, many years and I visited regularly and uh, we talked about his funeral and I couldn't take it. The high, I think, probably the really, I, I, I like being challenged in my thinking. I think the, the highest for me is being, has been having to think of other ways of doing things and, uh, and, uh, and wondering to what extent we can do things differently in the future and continue some of those things and how we might of course have done it differently <laughs> more time. Thank you very much. Um, the, the high, you know, Raguntag mentioned that the, it's the, the one day a week, the Shabbos, the Sabbath is when we turn everything off. So um, while we all week went online, we, we had to, we had no choice, um, was constant uh, pretty much, uh, pretty much every hour um, on, online, either preparing or putting our our uh, services or, or our online learning and to finally have one day to shut off was amazing i really the the, the beauty of, of the shabbat was, was was a tremendous high for us as a family we're able to um, bond together and um, be able to really appreciate the time that we had together so that was it's really it was really something special uh, on, on the other hand, um, the Shabbos was the one day, really, that we had, we were able to connect with the community, where every, most, that's when most of the congregation came to the synagogue. Mm -hmm. And so it was, we missed that, we, you know, uh, you know the, 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 that, that, that contact, that one-to-one, that -one, you know, interaction, it was like, you know, face-to-face, -face, we, we didn't have that. We, we, and so we... That was really is, and it's still really tough. Um, and we we're low, so we are very much looking forward to those doors opening and to be able to greet our our community once again. So it was a double edged sword for you. It was a double edged. Sword. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. And finally, have finally, um, uh, I'll in terms of the law is is the, the the closure of the mosques, uh, celebration of Eid, junior month of fasting of Ramadan, and funerals. That's probably the the low. Um, but in terms of the high. I think it got, gave us quality time to spend with family, uh, to look into our faith into even more uh, in depth and in more details, time to reflect, reflection, time to think. And for me, one of my highlights was, even though it's a sad element, the fact that I couldn't see uh, Rini towards the end of her uh, a few days of, uh, in this life, um, I still managed to put a few spades in and, and bury her in a most peaceful and respectful way that she would ever would want. That's lovely. Just to explain that Rini was the last known Jew to live in Blackburn. That's right. Uh, she was 96, I believe. She was 96. She turned 96. Yeah. So she was a member of St. Anne. That's how I got to know um, uh, uh, Hafiz Sadiq. Mm. And, uh, and the, Black, the Muslim community of Blackburn was very, very good to Rini, mm. especially yourself. I know you're very humble about it. And you've even made it in the news with seeing the two of you together. Mm. Very good to her. And sometimes it kind of embarrassed me that they're doing more than we were doing <laughs> Our show was 45 minutes away, drive from where she was. We could get there, especially on uh, Shabbos and Yonta festival. Uh, so Sadiq was uh, very, very good, looked after her and was very broken. When she how, did we, how did Rini become known to you, Happy Sadiq? What, what, this in, what this interfaith, interfaith Forum was set up ah, um, uh, in yes. 1999, 2003. Um, uh, I joined uh, my organisation with local council. And that is when I had given the responsibility of servicing the Interfaith Forum. Uh, and then two years later, uh, there was this campaign called Belonging with Blackman with Darwin campaign. 
and um, uh, coincidentally, me and uh, Rini were put together on a massive billboard and back of buses uh, in Blackpool, Darwin. So we kind of hit off straight then, and um, uh, past nine, ten years, um, uh, she has been living alone um, since Harry passed away. Um, passed away. May um, God bless his soul. And then Rini was alone. So at the time that the fact there's no Jewish shops in Blackburn uh, to, to to go to get Jewish meat, kosher meals, um, uh, bread. We used to take a trip to Manchester every six, seven, eight weeks. Uh, go to a Jewish shop, have a Jewish lunch, um, uh, go and see some Jewish friends, do some shopping yeah. some day, and then come back to um, uh, Blackburn after spending a whole day. So we used to it used to be a date. Uh, it used to be a date. Um, what uh, I hope you brought some stuff back for Rabbi Guttentag. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, lovely, that's, a, that's a lovely story and that's so heartwarming. Mm. It really is. Thank you for explaining that. Yeah. Um, I think we have all seen that there's a lot in common here. Mm. And uh, I just want people to really take uh, comfort from the fact that, you know, uh, everybody seems to be, you know, I'm this religion, I'm that religion. We're all dealing with the same issue and we're all in it together. And we all seem to be dealing with it together, mostly in the same way. Um, and I think this whole COVID situation has brought, brought this to light. I've seen it, um, and I'm sure that you've all, all seen this. Um, and it's, 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 it's a really wonderful thing to actually hear you all talk, and you're speaking exactly the same language. And I really appreciate this conversation. And I hope that whoever watches this will take great comfort and learn from it too. And going forwards, will um, we'll, we'll take the positive message that you will bring to their friends, family, and uh, future. So thank you very much indeed. It's thank been a great you. pleasure. Thank you very thank much. You thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.